this is our first program of the year. All right, um, we have two more programs planned already. The fourth graders will do a tour of the facility of the museum June either 7th or 8th. We're negotiating the date on that. And then our next program, which should be here, will, will be um, July 9th at 2 o'clock, and it will be the, the Craig Colony. So, without further ado, this is the intro that Quinn provided me with. After retiring with his bride of nearly 40 years in 2021, Quinn, Vivian, and Bushman the dog toured the United States in a camper trailer. Feeling the need to have roots, they came to Dansville, where Quinn had, has much loved family and several generations of ancestors. Purchasing a small home in the village, they have been busy, busy researching and restoring a little house. Quinn is a professional storyteller, having worked with several groups on many stages. Vivian is his re reason for existing, and Bushman's still a dog. You haven't promoted him? No. Okay. Bushman's Anyhow, still a dog. this is Quinn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Frankly, I am absolutely flabbergasted that there's this many people in this town that have interest in this house. It, it's got to be a slow week in Dansville. First of all, a couple of rules of engagement. Well, let me just make sure mine is off too. Make sure our phones are off. If you have a question, please interrupt me. Raise your hand and throw something. I'm not one of those speakers that says save your questions to the end because those are speakers that don't really want questions and hope that you'll forget them. And, and, and that's not what I do. Uh, further disclaimer, anytime I say I, I did this, I bought this, it's wrong. I need to say we, and I have a habit of saying I, and I get called upon it from time to time as well on the home front. So Vivian and I did this together. Although I swing the hammer and I haul the lumber and, and I do the, you know, the engineering and the heavy work, everything that has color attached to it Everything that has style, everything that matches everything else is 100% her efforts. And it's not mine. Because I would be just as happy to build the wall, put the sheetrock on it, put a layer of white paint on it, and walk away and be done with it. So I do tend to take things kind of to the next level. So she'll say, well, it'd be nice if we had some wood trim over here. Well, that means I have to go out and begin to make router blades to you know, make the wood trim, and, and I do tend to get a little overboard with things. Um, but the other piece of my we, when I say I, is my working partner, whom I would not be able to produce anything here if I didn't have the constant help of my constant companion, Chuck Infantino. So Chuck has been right there by my side, and we're, we're going to talk about Chuck in just a little bit, too. Uh, but... <laughs> saws all chuck so but that's really what it's all about and i've had a lot of neighbors and a lot of friends i've had some great help from from neighbors bill and terry derenbacher right next door have been a great help i've had people stop by and walk in the yard and say my grandmother used to live here it's so nice to see somebody working on it and my so-and-so used to live here and my uncle used to live here uh, and so we're really thrilled to come here and, uh, and, and be a part of this community. So I grew up in New Hampshire. If you can't tell, I'm not a native of, of, of New York. Um, but I have family here in New York. So many, many years ago, my grandfather lived here in New York. And my grandfather was the maintenance manager of the school bus yard down in Wayland. And he did that job for quite a few years. He tended to have itchy feet and think the grass was green or, green or somewhere else. Uh, and so he moved his family around quite a lot, much to my father's chagrin. My father was a junior in high school and going to school in Wayland when my grandparents decided that they were going to move back to New Hampshire uh, after an incident that occurred within the family. And my father said, You've put me into 17 different schools. 
since I started first grade, come hella high water, I'm going to graduate from this one. And my Uncle Al and Aunt Marion here in Dansville, at, they, they died here in Dansville, they weren't then, but they took him in and let him live with them for the last two years so he could finally have some stability and finish his high school. My grandfather had, hello folks, my grandfather had 19 kids in his family. 17 of them grew up to become adults uh, and begin to reproduce. So it was a huge clan of Goldens. Uh, and uh, my grandfather's sister, one, one of the sisters still lives here in Dansville today. I have lots of cousins here. The Gillards, the Infantinos are, are cousins. The, uh, I had an uncle who lived here named Alan Gray. And Alan and, uh, and his wife, they owned potato farms down in Wayland on the hill and grew and sold Wayland brand potatoes for a number of years from the 40s up until early 60s. Thank you. Up until the early 60s where he sold that property to the Mahaney's who own the, the Mahaney farms today. And that was, that was his, his farms. Uh, so we have a fair amount of, of history here in New York. And the Grays, Alan Gray, hired a great many people to work on the potato farms. So after my grandmother moved to New Hampshire to teach school in the 1920s, because she could get into a, what they called a normal school at the time, which was an advanced school for, so she could get her teaching certificate, she moved to New Hampshire in order to do it, where she met my grandfather, where they got married in the little town of Barnstead, New Hampshire, and with Seven, with 16 brothers and sisters, that comprised of a fairly large labor pool. And in the 1920s, 1930s, coming into the 40s, uh, labor was, was pretty enticing. And so a number of my grandfather's brothers moved here to New York to pick potatoes and to work on the farms. And that also brought a lot of family to this area. My great-grandfather was born in New York, although not here in Dansville. And he was a very colorful individual. He saw it upon himself to travel. Now, he was the father to the 19 kids. But my great-grandmother did most of the raising. Great-grandpa, grandpa as we called him, my grandfather was Pappy, and my great-grandfather was grandpa. So grandpa was rather well known to go down to the, the, down to the docks, down to the depot where the train station was with a couple of cans of milk on the wagon, hand them over, hear of an opportunity somewhere, hop on the train and go pursue it. And it would usually be a paying opportunity, but it was an opportunity that he enjoyed nonetheless. He might be gone a week, he might be gone a month, he might be gone three months. My great-grandmother might have known where he was, and she might not have. Well, he also liked the whiskey. And between his traveling and his whiskey, uh, he wound up a single man by the time you know, the 1950s come along. So like I say, my great-grandmother done most of the raising. Now, when I was a youngster, about eight years old, my great-grandfather lived just down the road from us, just a short distance. And I could walk down to his place. You see, he was bounced around from family to family because he was what they called in those days a mean drunk. Now, I never saw it. It just, it just never happened in my presence. But I do understand that's why he would spend time living with different children and different family members. And he wound up living with my uncle Paul, which was my grandfather's younger brother in the same town that I was in. So at the age of eight years old, I would walk down to see my grandpa because he would tell stories, <laughs> all the stories he would tell. Because of his travels and all the things he had done, he actually was, he called it a roustabout for Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show at one time in his life. And at the age of eight years old, you couldn't have been the president of the United States and been any more impressive than somebody who was a roustabout for Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show. <laughs> and he worked the railroad, so he traveled. And he worked the railroad in the town of Barnstead. Barnstead had a short line, an extension of the B&M, which went, ran from Suncook 
New Hampshire to Barnston, New Hampshire, and my grandfather worked on it. And he was never an engineer by title, but I have pictures of him standing on the cab and in the cab of the Blueberry Express, which was the steam engine that ran that loop from Barnstead through a dozen towns and wound up in Suncook. And the reason he was usually in the cab was that the engineer was too intoxicated to do his job that day. But that was a whole different process and a whole different time. Uh, so I would go to see my, when I would see my, grand, my uh, great grandpa, he would often tell me the stories and he would tell me stories about people in town. Well, as an eight year old in a small town, you knew all the people in town that he was talking about. And he'd make comments like, yeah, you know that hammy stocks, you know why he's so screwed up, don't you? And I'd say, no, Grandpa, why? <laughs> and, and I knew that he was screwed up. At eight years old, I knew that the, the man wasn't right. And he said, because his mother, Arthur and Mary, are first cousins. <laughs> so I learned things about people in town that no eight-year-old boy is supposed to know. <laughs> When I would leave his place to go back home on Saturday afternoon, we might have watched a Red Sox game, or he was fond of making strawberry shortcake, and we would eat that. But when I would go home, he would give me a quarter. And the idea of the quarter was so when I came back next week, I would stop at the store, Mountain's General Store, which was between my house and his house, and I would buy him a plug of chewing tobacco, and a Concord Monitor, which was the paper that he liked. The Concord Monitor was the liberal paper in town, and he did not want me to get that Manchester Union Leader, which was the conservative paper in town. Do not come in with it. So we had a, a symbiotic relationship since the plug of tobacco in the paper left about seven cents in my pocket. And that was enough for a popsicle and two pieces of penny candy. So we got along really well. And I remember one day my father said to me, I think it's so great that you walk down to see your grandpa every, every Saturday afternoon. And I said, oh my gosh. I thought to myself, if he only knew. <laughs> Grandpa's working his way down the line and he's going to get to you sooner or later. <laughs> so it was great fun. And I grew up in town. I lost grandpa in 1972. He died from pneumonia. He was 94, uh, 92. I believe he was 92 or 94 years old, and he had a great illustrious life, and it was, it was just it was great fun. So I grew up in New Hampshire. I grew up doing a lot of public speaking. I taught, uh, I belonged to a professional society where we taught manufacturers just-in-time concepts, uh, Kanbans, uh, yellow belt, and, and all that crap. And it was horribly mundane topics to have to teach. It's boring as hell. The brain only absorbs what the ass can stand. And <laughs> those subjects were long and they were terrible. So I learned to tell stories to try to keep people interested in the mundane crap that I was shoveling them. So I did a lot of mechanical engineering for a living in addition to, to, to doing the, the teaching. And I did it in the field. So I would travel to paper mills and lumber mills, and I would help them to engineer and design conveyor systems, uh, lift systems, elevators. If you had to move product from one place to another, that was my specialty. And my specialty was gearboxes. So I knew gearboxes, understood them, you know, the, the concepts of how they work, of gear reduction, and that's what I specialized in. Well, in, 19, uh, in 2019, I had been working for the same company for quite a while. I was two years short of a full pension. I was 59 years old. I was two years short of my pension, and some things were happening. The country was actually in a manufacturing recession in 2019, and that was due to the tariffs that were being placed upon manufacturers from bringing in goods. And most of my customers were on the Canadian border in Maine. My large paper mills and my large lumber mills were owned by Canadians. Well, they did a lot of business. They brought in pulpwood from Canada because it's a lot easier to bring pulpwood in when you're 25 miles from the Canadian border from Canada than it is to, to bring it in locally. So 
they started to buy their raw materials from Canada and the lumber mills did the same thing. And there was so much exchange on the border internationally that the paper mills that re in the U.S. paper mills owned that relied on the Canadian timber coming across could now no longer be competitive because of the tariffs that they were facing. And they began to shut down. So just because paper mills have been moving out of this country for a lot of years, in about 10 years, I lost six paper mills. And then as we came through 2019 and all of that stuff happened, I lost three or four very large lumber mills, and then I lost a pulp mill. So the territory was really struggling, and then COVID hit. And my employer instantly panicked, and he did so before the government said, wait a minute, we're going to make you whole. They went into panic mode, and they began to eliminate not underperforming territories, in which mine was one of them. So at 59 years old, I found myself unemployed and two years shy of collecting a pension. For the third time in my working career, I had lost a pension for one reason or another. So I had a big network, and I reached out to my network immediately, and one of my customers, one of my largest customers that I did work with, so I, I represented the manufacturer, did the engineering for the manufacturer, and the uh, distributor would sell us a lot of the parts or would sell the customer a lot of the parts. So I worked with a lot of distributors, Command, Motion Industries, Applied. Um, you know, they, they, those names may mean something to you, they may not, but they're nationwide distributors. I reached out to one of them, and they instantly, I had an interview within a week, I had an offer three days later, and it was enough money to keep me gainfully employed. But then COVID really hit and my start date got pushed back another six months. So I now spent another six months in limbo, not really knowing what was going to happen. Well, I was hired. I started in uh, early June of, of that uh, 2020 and I worked for them for a couple of years or a year and a half. And then they decided that the, the company that owned them should spin them off and should sell them to yet another company. And in order to make our company lean as possible, they began to cut salaries. Uh, they took away the company truck. They decided that we should buy cars instead of trucks. Well, they never could figure out how I could you know, show up at a customer site at seven o'clock in the morning, put a 4,000 pound gearbox in the back of my car and bring it to a repair facility to get it fixed. So clearly that was not going to work either. And now I was 59, approaching 60, and facing the realistic that I would probably again be unemployed very shortly and had been there such a short period of time uh, that there were no benefits to come my way. Well, you know, there's a the silver linings happen sometimes when you don't expect them. And because of where I lived, because of the house I happened to have owned, because I was diligent in paying my mortgage, and every time we refinanced the house, we paid it down. We never extended the life of it. So we would increase the payment to take the years off of the end. So at 25 years in the house, I essentially owned it. I was a, I was a fortuitous position. And around the country, in little pockets like this, housing values were skyrocketing. Most of America didn't see that. But in various parts of New England, it was happening. And my wife would say, I was on Zillow today, and the forecast price for our house is $10,000 higher than it was last week, which piqued my interest. <laughs> she said it repeatedly, Every couple of weeks, she would throw the number in front of me, and she would throw the number in front of me. And then we started hearing about houses in the area that had gone on the market, and the bidding wars had commenced for them. And people were getting 30 and 40 percent higher than the asking price in an area where houses are already overinflated. The average house already sells for over $200,000 in, in this particular, particular area. Now, New Hampshire is a beautiful state to visit. It's absolutely gorgeous, but it's a very expensive state to live in. The whole tax-free New Hampshire thing doesn't really work. 
they'll tell you it does. The idea is if you live in a border state, you'll come to New Hampshire and you'll buy our cheap liquor and you won't have to pay a sales tax on it. And that's the extent of the whole tax-free New Hampshire scam. <laughs> so as the house continued to increase in value, at one point in time, she shared with me a number and I looked at it and I said, that would bridge us from now until I'm 62 and I could start working on my, collecting my 401k. I could collect the social security in my 401k and that number would bridge us and I still have the remnants of this piece of pension. So we might be able to do this. And my attitude at work changed a little bit. It always does when you think you might have an out, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I go to work and I would, would do my job and it was getting tougher and tougher. And the employer was saying, you have to go into this plant and see this person. And when I would walk into that plant, the first word out of the mouth would be, you walk in here with that mask on and I ain't giving you no orders. The politics between masking and unmasking was, was terrible. And I was doing a job. My employer required me to mask, to sanitize, to clean my car with alcohol wipes when I got into it. There were requirements that we had to do, and it was job dependent that we do them. And yet, you'd walk into a facility and you would be disparaged immediately. So you, it, it, you'd walk in and you wouldn't know whether to wear the mask or not wear the mask. And it got to a point where was, this is just too damn stressful. I'm nearly 60 years old. This isn't why I've lived this long. Well, the number in the house hit another, another spot. And I said to my wife, this is it. I'm going to do it. We're going to do this. We're going to list the house for sale. And I'm going to quit my job. And prepping this house for market will be my full-time job. So we scavenged up enough money to make sure we could pay the bills. I anticipated it would probably take me six to eight weeks because I had done a lot of work on the house early on. I had built timber frame porches on the back of it. It was a log house and it was the proverbial little log house on the hilltop, so to speak. It had a beautiful view. I could see all the way to Maine out the back end of it. But I had done most of the work on the house and most of the work on the house was now 20 or 25 years old and it needed to be redone. Well, one of the things that needed to be done was trees needed to be cut between my house and a house down, lower down on the hill, because we had deeded view rights. And I had to make sure that the view was preserved so when I sold it, I could maximize you know, the value of the deed by saying, you have deeded view rights. Nobody can do anything down here to obstruct your view. In New Hampshire, we have what's called a view tax. You're literally taxed on your property if you have a view. It's, it's a line item, view, extra thousand dollars. So I had to make sure that, I, that, that that view was there for the prospective buyers. So I went down to see my neighbor down below and I said, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm going to have a guy coming in next week and we're going to cut some of these trees. But I'll leave, because he was below me. I said, we'll leave anything that's eight or 10 feet tall or less because that'll give you the buffer. You know, so you don't see my house. We, we get along well. He said, you're going to sell your house? I said, yeah. I said, I am. I said, I, I'm, we're, we're done. We're going to sell it. We're going to move on. We're going to live someplace else. I don't know where yet, but we're going to sell the house. He said, well, my mother-in-law has always said, if that log home up on the hill goes up for sale, I want to know about it. He said, can I tell her? I said, well, you can tell her if you want to, but you know, I'm six weeks out you know, from, at a minimum before I'd be ready to sell the place. But if you want to tell her, you, you, you can tell her. That's, that's just fine. 20 minutes later, my phone rang. <laughs> she was requesting an appointment to come and see it. I said, well, it won't be ready to sell for at least six weeks. I mean, I've been here for 25 years and things have happened and I need to fix stuff because I did most of the work 25 years. She said, that's okay. I don't care. Can I come in the morning? I said, yeah, you can. You're welcome to come in the morning. She lives 75 miles away. At 8 o'clock in the morning, she pulled into my driveway. 
She got out of the car and we met. And she was a wonderful, nice woman. We talked about the house. We walked around it. I showed her what we had done, the landscaping. I showed her what I needed to fix. The timber frames holding up the back porch were, had visible rot and decay at the bottom. And I was going to take those posts out and I was going to put new ones in. And I showed her other things. The pool deck was, was, was curled. You know, we had an above ground pool with a wooden deck around it. You know how the old pressure treated lumber will curl in due time. So I said, I'm going to take this off and I'm going to redeck it. And she looked at me and she said, don't bother. I said, well, I have to do this to fix. She said, don't bother. She said, my husband can do timber frame work and he'd rather do these himself. I said, okay, well, I'll just strip and I'll just do the deck because that's really easy. I don't have to do any jacks or anything. She said, don't bother because he's going to want to remove all the decking from the pool. So when he does the timber frame work, he's going to want to redeck the pool to match the timber frame work because that's what he does. I said, okay, well, that's fine. I said, well, I still need to. She said, don't bother. <laughs> she said, I don't care what you have to do to the house. She said, I don't care if you walk away and leave it with everything in it just the way it is. I'll hire a crew. We'll bring in the dumpsters and we'll clean it out. That's how bad she wanted this house. And it was nothing special. I mean, I, I bought it. I paid $110,000 for it. It was just a, a routine house. But we'd put a lot into it. And I said, well, I, I am going to list it. Now, we had had a conversation with a realtor who he came up with a plan, and we came up with a number, and he had this whole strategy as to how he was going to list it to maximize our profit. And he gave me the number, and, and we knew what his fee was going to be so we can anticipate what I would get out of it. And he said, if I, can, if I can put together a bidding war, he said, you might be able to get this number out of it. So that's what we were gambling on. She offered me a number that would easily cover what I was going to pay him and the top number of any bidding war that could ever possibly happen. I took the deal. <laughs> the next day, without question, I told her I wanted an outrageous deposit. It was a six-figure deposit that I wanted on the house. The next day, she wired me the money. Three days later, her lawyer called me because <laughs> they were very concerned that her and I had cut this deal and she had sent me all this money and we essentially had no paperwork between us. All we literally had was a bill of sale that I had written and they wanted to know who my lawyer was. I said, she's sitting right here beside me. I've been married to her for 40 years. So that got a little bit interesting. But bottom line is we sold the house. We bought a camper. We bought a truck and we hit the road and we toured the United States. We intended to do it for an undeterminate amount of time. And that's what we did. We didn't care where we went. And we went wherever we felt like going, however we felt like going. So I have six children and they all live in different places around the country for the most part. So we started by going to visit them. We visited friends in Vermont and we, we just toward the country and we had a really good time there are some logistical struggles to that lifestyle number one you are officially homeless you don't have a home you don't have an address now legally we were able to use my daughter's address in Dover New Hampshire so we were able to have that as a legal address but you're traveling out of state our bank was not national our health care, I had to buy into the ACA when I, and thank God it was there, but I bought into that. And that was a New Hampshire plan because all the ACA plans are state dependent. So when you're traveling out of state, you have insurance coverage issues. So we had mail issues, we had insurance coverage issues. We had all the issues that just, you know, as my grandfather, grandpa used to say, it's a burr under the saddle. So even though it was a really good time, he also used to say, even a blind dog finds a bone once in a while, and if he does, he better pick it up. And I had found, this I'd found the bone. But the traveling constantly, and, and it's nerve-wracking to travel that way. So I had a 35-foot camper, and it was very nice, and I had a pickup truck with extended cab, so the dog had his own space in the back seat, and it was very nice. Bumper to bumper, this whole assembly was 60 feet long. A tractor trailer 
coming up behind me when he would, would get a quarter of the way up the back of the trailer, I could feel the back end of, of the thing get pulled a little bit. And when they would go by you all the way, the draft in back of the tractor trailer, you could feel it pull you a little bit in the other way. Cars would only see a camper and they would think, well, I can just skitty poop right around this camper, not knowing I was consuming 60 feet of road or just or not, not rationalizing that I'm consuming 60 feet of road, which is longer than the trailer on a tractor trailer. They would come out and they would start to go by and before they could get that distance, you know, at, at 55 miles an hour, a car would be sometimes coming the other way. They would not, they would misjudge the length of time it would take them. Or they would go by me and then when they would get to the front, they would realize that, you know, there was another vehicle that they were coming up on as well and they would cut right in front of me. They would, they would, you would, the taillights would disappear under the hood of the truck. Not, you know, I was just as good at taking my hand and reaching for the trolley brake to, to break the trailer as I was to get my foot onto the brake. You can only do that for so many hours a day. So it's not like you can, you know, you're riding along with your arm around your, you know, your best friend, and you can tune the radio and just traveling and looking out the window at the sights and the sounds. It's game on <laughs> and it's tense and it's difficult and it's wearing. So we would only travel for three or four hours a day. And, and then I'd have to stop and I'd have to set this whole rig up. And it had slides on it and it had the awning. And so you'd have to assemble your house every single night. And you'd have to find a place to park the damn thing every single night. And it's not always as easy to say, well, we're going to travel X number of miles today. So let's just find a campground there. Well, there may not be a campground there. If there is, they may not have room. So we spent many a night in a Walmart parking lot or in back of a Cracker Barrel because they actually allow travelers to use their parking lots. But it's not comfortable spending the night in a Walmart parking lot in a lot of money worth of rig by itself is a little disconcerting. Now Bushman, the dog, is a hound. And if you live within earshot of Sophia Street, there is no doubt in my mind you've heard him. Well, in a Walmart parking lot in a trailer, every noise outside results in a <laughs> So traveling can be hard. And after we had done it for many months, uh, close to a year, we began to feel ungrounded. Mostly Vivian, my wife. She began to feel ungrounded. She's not here tonight because she has the, the luxury of being with my daughter, husband, and grandchildren. Uh, they live in Wisconsin, and she's there, for the, she's there for a spell. So the, the whole traveling thing, and we were ungrounded, she more so than me. We had spent the winter in Arizona, which I kind of liked. I mean, I, I don't like snow. I really like the stable temperatures of southwest Arizona. It was kind of cool, but that meant there was no Christmas. To Vivian, Christmas is snow and green Christmas trees and lights and hot chocolate, and that is Christmas. And there's no Christmas in Arizona. So we decided we needed a house. We began to talk. We've seen the country. What do, where do we want to live? And she said, how about Dansville? Well, we'd been to Dansville several times. We come here for the Lions show every single year for probably 13 years running. And we came out here when my grandfather was alive. He had moved from New Hampshire uh, back here. And, and so we'd made many, many trips out here. And she said, I said, well, you shouldn't have to convince me. I said, well, Dansville would be really cool. I have roots there. That's, those are my people. And she said, but only if we live in the village. I said, okay, that's fine. And she said, I want to walk to Main Street to get a cup of coffee. I want to walk to a bar. I want to walk to a restaurant. You see, our entire nearly 40 years of marriage was spent way out in the country. We were frequently the last house on a dead end road. If you suddenly realize you forgot something that you desperately needed for supper, it was at least a minimum 45 minute round trip to get to the nearest store to purchase anything to come back home again. And she did not want to live that way anymore. I did not blame her. 
So we began to research and find a house. Jumpstart you. So we contacted, or she started on the Zilla. Zilla got us out of New Hampshire. Zilla will probably get us into our next home. And she started looking at houses for sale here in Dansville. And then we were fortunate enough to reach out to a realtor. And this is Joan Hart from Empire Realty. She is the nicest, most patient, most accommodating realtor person I've ever met in my life. She worked with us. We would call up and say, what about this house? When she knew that that house was nothing that we would want to live in. We were in Arizona. She would still go there. And she would, would take her phone out. And she would FaceTime us. And she would walk around with her phone showing us the attributes, good and bad, of all the houses. We looked at several of them. We actually put offers in on a couple of them. And a couple of them we put blind offers in. We just, somebody said, hey, so-and-so, you know, has passed away. We know this house is empty. And can you hook me in touch? And we would just make them a, just an offer, just to, just to try to, do, to, to find something. But Joan was wonderful. Uh, we signed up eventually after looking at several different houses and not finding anything you know, online and, and with FaceTime. We, Joan signed us up for alerts. So when a new house went on to the MLS in the village of Dansville, we would get a, an alert on our phone. Technology is wonderful. They can do that now. And one morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, my phone pinged and it said there was a new house in Dansville. And my wife, who always gets up before me in the morning, was out in the, uh, in the other piece of the camper. Her phone pinged as well. And I heard her say, hey, did you get your phone? Did you see this? <laughs> well, I wiped the sleep out of my eyes and I go ahead and I opened up the phone and this was what I saw. And I said, hmm, okay, well, that's a house. <laughs> looks a little neglected, looks a little worn. But then we hopped on and we started looking at, the, at all of the ads, all 13 of the pictures. And I said, well, okay, you know, it's, uh, it's basically straight. It's got a decent roof line. Now, realtors taking photographs of houses, they have all these tricks that they do when they take the pictures. Now what you can't see in this picture, what doesn't really show, whoops, excuse me, is that you know, this is rotted, this is, water is essentially running right straight down, right through there. This mudroom on the back of the house, the entire corner of this foundation is totally gone. The thing is literally listing eight inches down on one side and six inches from the back of the house. But none of that stuff seems to get included in the photographs from the realtors. So this was, an ups this was a scene inside. And I looked at this and I said, oh, cool lamp. OK, well, I see I got woodwork. And the, and the wood is still there. And I'm a big fan of woodwork. I, I adore woodwork, especially old woodwork. And I looked at it. I said, I bet that's chestnut. And this was kind of cool because the stairs went up and turned at an angle with a window at the landing. We'd never had anything like that before. In any, in any house that we'd ever own. I said, that, that's really kind of cool. And then we saw the kitchen. And I said, okay, well, that needs to be renovated. But what we couldn't see in the photographs was the cabinet here that was literally torn off of the wall and hanging and the holes in the, just out of, out of side of the frame. The picture of the stairs, by the way, was taken at just such an angle. So the holes that were punched in the wall at the head of the stairs and the landing weren't visible in any of the pictures. Uh, this, this looked good. No, this wasn't too bad. Uh, but just out of sight here at the top of the frame, just, just out of this frame was significant damage to the ceiling because when the house was abandoned, it was a solid year before they winterized it. So the plumbing for the upstairs bathroom, which is here, comes up this wall, goes across the ceiling into the bathroom. And from standing in the living room, you could look up and see exactly where the pipes went. Because every horizontal pipe in the house was frozen and broken. But that wasn't in the listing either. Uh, this was the living room. And what got me here was the floors. I said, boy, the hardwood floors, they look decent. And, the, and this trim is still here. You know, this trim, I, I like that. This is, I like wood. 
And that, that wooden floor, that's got something. I'll bet that's chestnut. And this was a shot of an upstairs bedroom. I said, okay, so somebody's been in there doing something to it. All the wood trim is gone. I could see that. I could see a, you know, a lesser than premium quality sheetrock job. I said, somebody has started doing something to it. It's a failed project. Um, and then this, they, they, they showed this damage. So I got to see there was some damage somewhere in this house. Uh, but what, what I saw here was I saw plain one by four pine boards for molding. So I knew that the wood had been stripped out of that room as well. So I would, I would need to do that. And I said, okay, well, we can work with this. Here's another upstairs bedroom out the back. Ooh, I said, original wood, original wood in the door. And the door casing was original wood. So that turned me on. I really liked it. And this, I know this doesn't excite normal people, but this excited me. Because when I saw it, I knew the house was built around 1900, because that's what the real estate listing said. And I knew enough about old houses to know that this horizontal beadboard was original to the house, which meant it was unmolested for 120 years. And that made me happy. That's what I am. That's what takes, make me happy. So upstairs bathroom, I said, okay, we got to renovate that. I found this to be rather interesting. I wasn't sure what it was. It was a cat door or somebody had done something. Well, I have never in my life seen tombstone shaped heat ducts, hot air ducts. And you all have probably seen them because it seems to be a New York thing. I've never saw them anywhere else in the country, but I have since seen them in other houses here in the village. So it, it's got to be something that happened. And so they're cast iron, and that's where the hot air comes out of. But they'd all been stolen out of the house between the time it was abandoned and the time that we finally got there. So, of course, that necessitated going out in the world and finding these things. But I said, okay, we can, we can renovate the bathroom. I've done bathroom work before. It's not a big deal. And then I looked at the backyard. And I said, this is odd, because my experience tells me that folks in Dansville typically have nice-looking lawns. They, they, you know, they do a good job on their lawns. And this thing has this weird-looking hump here, and this hump here, and this hump here. And I said, what the heck is all of that about? Well, we found out eventually the previous owner had a dirt bike track in his backyard and allowed the children to go around and around in a figure eight for hours and days on end. I heard about that dirt bike track from this person, this person, this person, this person, this person, and the people across the street. I had to swear to them all, I have a dog, but I do not have a dirt bike. So we took possession. We closed on it. We had, it was a HUD home. It was at auction. We had to bid. They had to receive our bid by a certain time. There was a cutoff. They give preference to owner occupants. So if you're going to bid on it and you swear that you're going to live in it, you get preference. So you get to bid. Now the flippers are going to come along and they're going to bid as well. But if your bid meets what HUD thinks is their sales requirement, it doesn't matter if the flippers overbid you. You'll still get it. That's the, the key to HUD home. It's government and they want owner operators. They don't want flippers to buy these houses. Flippers and houses aren't good for the local economy, but people who take houses and renovate them are. We had a number of legal issues and what was supposed to take roughly four weeks took well over 16 weeks. We had problems with the lawyers. I wound up firing the lawyer who was first assigned to the HUD case, and I got another lawyer up in Rochester to take the case, and then we closed in four weeks. I paid well over $1,000 in fines to HUD just to keep the project alive because the lawyer handling it was incompetent. One of the other things you get to deal with when you, when you do a HUD home. And there's nobody you can talk to. You can't sit down and say, can we fix this, please? What's going on? It's, it, it's just, nope, HUD's going to kill it. For, and, you know, and, and you'd get less than 24 hours notice. HUD says you have to buy an extension because it's been too long. Well, it's not my fault it's been too long. doesn't matter. HUD wants an extension, and the extension is $250 a day. 
So anyway, we got through that. We finally closed, and I got on an airplane in Arizona, and I flew here to Dansville to find out what the heck we had bought. Because <laughs> we hadn't seen it, except through FaceTime videos. So my first thing is the garage. Because I told Vivian we will buy whatever you want for a house. I do not care what the house looks like. I don't care what shape it is. I don't care what style it is. I don't care what shape it's in, but I need a garage. I need a workshop. I need a workshop to fix the house. My parameters for a workshop is that it be large enough to fit four small cars in. Does not mean I own four small cars. It means that's the amount of room that I needed to calculate, that I needed to have in this workshop. So when we came into town, I looked and I saw the garage. Now when the realtors were showing us the housing, the garage was locked. It had a lock on it. And the realtors didn't have the key. And HUD didn't know if there was a key or not. So we never got access to the inside of the garage, other than what the realtor could show us through the window and the door holding the phone up. And I said, well, okay, it's, it's a shop, it's a garage, it's good size. Uh, this, this is a 10-foot door, and it has 10-foot ceilings, and I knew that. So I said, that's a good workable space, I can work with that. Well, after we got the garage, and I got here in January, uh, I, had, I had my partner in crime, Chuck, break into the garage. I owned it so we could do it now. And we immediately, first thing I saw and could smell was all of this mold and decay and these ceiling panels on the other side were hanging down and drooping and they were moldy and they were physically wet and there was water running down the walls and there was water on the floor. The roof was leaking and had been leaking for a very long period of time. This was the culprit. Somebody had installed a heating system inside of it and had poked a chimney up through the roof and did not do it right. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why we have code enforcement. It's why we have building permits. So this stuff is inspected and things are put in and they're safe. I had a very close relationship with code enforcement here in town. I worked with her constantly because every time I would open up a wall or open something up and look at it, it's like, oh my God, this is not what I was expecting. And I would come up with a plan to fix it. I would call code enforcement, says the plan's changed. And then we would get together and we would talk about it. So this was where the chimney was. This was a skylight that had been put in. And as you can see, the skylight was leaking. I don't know what that is, but that was leaking. This was leaking. And this entire edge, this whole leading edge of the roof line was rotted. It was truss construction. So the trusses were rotted. The cap was rotted. Everything was just rotted and gone to pieces. The building was literally a snowstorm away from collapse. And had it collapsed, this far wall on the other side, right near the edge, let's see, that's just interior damage. This is the wall that would have gone out and it would have gone into the side of Mr. Derenbacher's garage and who, who knows what would have happened. When, if, when the roofers first got there and they started walking on the roof, they come back down off of the roof and they said, it's not, we can't go up there, it's not safe. We have to do something different to get up onto your roof, Mr. Golden. And the conversation was waffling between replacing the entire building or being able to put a roof on it. It was, it was, it was that tenuous for a short period of time. Partially because it's trust construction. Trusses are easy and they're cheap, but they're dangerous. Firemen hate trusses. Buildings, commercial buildings that have trusses on them have to have a special placket on the outside so firemen know that it's a truss construction because when a fire gets into a building, when a truss burns through, the roof fails all at once. They're dangerous that way. Why they would use trusses, I don't know. Bill doesn't have trusses. It, Bill has a nice attic you can walk through and I've got all these trusses to get through. Anyway, we worked our way through it. We got the thing fixed. We got a roof on it and we were able to move on, and then I was able to get in and start exploring the house. So I was here for a predetermined period of time in January. Chuck had freed his schedule and was loyally by my side for every minute I could possibly want him, and we began to rip up carpeting, and we had a dumpster come in, and 
we peeled stuff back as best as we could, made the best use of time possible, but I was really delighted when we pulled up two layers of carpet that the hardwood floor worked its way on through. And I said, this might be my bone. <laughs> Blind dog finds a bone. The floors looked pretty good. I got a hold of Bobby Hall, local floor sander. You, you may know of him. And I asked him to come in and look at my floors. And he said, you know, Quinn, he said, these floors have never been sanded. Somebody put carpet over them decades and decades ago. He said, I've got tons of material to work with. I said, how did the blind dog find another bone? So we peeled the carpeting off of the stairs, and I found the stairs, and as we went up them, we actually found a lot of the treads were cracked and broken, and they essentially were beyond repair, so we had to do something totally different with the stairs. Uh, however, we, we, they were structurally they were okay, and we loved this landing in this window because we'd never had a house that had that before. So after we had stripped all of the carpeting out of the rooms downstairs and we got those exposed, we started to get into the kitchen. And this was what it was like when we first picked it up. And here's, here's my partner, Chuck, just kind of staring out the window, wondering what in the hell he got himself into. <laughs> and we <laughs> began to disassemble the kitchen. But we persevered and we did get everything down and everything out and neither one of us got hurt. So you'll notice that this is like a tile floor on this side, and on this view, it's an entirely different floor. And if you look closely at this tile floor, you can see it's on a plywood substrate, and you can see a different tile underneath it there. And then over here, you can see a different tile underneath it there. And then all the way down to the bottom layer was a felt paper. All in all, there were seven layers of flooring that we had to remove and the bottom layer come off real mean. It come off in these little, little tiny pieces. Uh, it was glued down, and there was a felt paper underneath it, and the felt paper was glued down, and then there were the staples. <laughs> Holding down the subfloor, the substrate they put under the tiles, they put in these staples to staple it down below all the other layers, and somebody was clearly paid by the staple. <laughs> because after hours of working, you can see the staples have been removed from this area, and this is kind of fuzzy, but what you see here are staples, sometimes in rows four or five wide, I would count as many as 30 staples to a linear foot. And after I would go to Chuck and Katie's house at night, and they would warmly feed me a nice supper. When Chuck would be done for his day, I would go back down to the house, and I would sit on the floor with these hand tools, and I would pop these staples out one after another, after another, after another. And I think I spent probably four nights with four to five hours a night just simply removing the staples. There's a chimney in the corner, and Vivian was quite adamant she said, when you build me my new kitchen, I want the bricks of the chimney exposed. And I said, that would look really nice. So it had been plastered, and I did a test there to make sure I could get the plaster off of the bricks, and I could. So once we had gutted the kitchen, Chuck came in one morning after I had already been there, and he saw me looking up. He said, what you looking at? I said, I'm looking at those can lights. I said, they don't belong here. They don't fit the character of the house. They have to go. Chuck said, hand me my Sawzall. <laughs> so we popped down one of the can lights, and I stuck my iPhone up in there on record mode, and I did one of these, and I found out that not only was there two ceilings here, staple and sheetrock, but the whole ceiling was raftered and hanging 18 inches below the original ceiling in the house. So in addition to the six to seven floors, I had three ceilings. <laughs> Chuck made short work of the ceiling. So we re removed it, we cut it down into pieces, we did not get hurt, and we got it down to the rafters that were there, and then we cut the rafters so we could disassemble and take them down, and by the end of the day, we had the original ceiling, which actually is in nice condition, considering. 
Now it had issues. It, it had you know issues around here and, and whatnot, but that was okay because we had a plan for that. But I gained 18 inches back of height in that room. Now it's a very small kitchen. It's a galley kitchen. I mean, you can see how narrow it is. It, it's literally, it's you know, it's literally eight feet wide. So you really need all the space that you can get, even though it's you know overhead, just from a looks perspective. So upstairs, we began to work next on the upstairs bathroom because we had to gut the bathroom. Remember, every pipe in the house was frozen and broken, and all of the pipes ran underneath the floor from this outside wall under the floor to the tub and then to the bathrooms and, and to the toilet. So here we are formulating a plan as to what we're going to do next. And there is the, there's the required sawzall, and Chuck was ready, ready, willing, and able to use it. So we wound up, we did use it, and I wanted to take the tub from this space, and I wanted to install it this way because it would give me a lot more room in the bathroom. You literally, you know, you had less than two feet there. And I said, geez, if we just turn this tub, but that meant that this wall had to be pushed back. So it already came down at an angle and it went down through here. And then we extended it and went down through there to gain another 24 inches so we could put a tub in along that wall in that direction. And this is the, we removed the surround and the extra wall board and out of order. And then we began to tackle the tile floor. And it was a tile that was glued down. Now we knew we had to take up the tile and the subfloor to get down to the plumbing, which was of course all broken. So we worked our way down until we got to it. Then we discovered all kinds of really wonderful things. For example, they shored up this particular joist with a two by four and then proceeded to drill nearly a four inch hole through the two by four to run a piece of plumbing. Pretty much negating the effort of putting the two by four there in the first place, which they actually put in because they knew that drilling a hole would compromise the integrity of the joist. Was that barn wood? Uh, no, it was just a, just a, a rough cut, oh. a true, true size of floor joist. Uh, okay, there's the tub glass, the tub coming out. Hmm, I seem to be a little out of order. But now, although they saw the integrity of this particular joist, the integrity of this particular joist didn't seem to bother them any. <laughs> and the integrity of this particular joist didn't, didn't bother them all. <laughs> so, you know, this is the type of stuff you find. This is why there's code enforcement. This is why they say, yes, start doing the work and let us see it before you cover it up. So obviously there were some undocumented features in this floor and we come up with a plan to fix it, which we did. So we sistered full size uh, two by eights on each side of the joists that were there. We filled in the pieces that were cut out and sistered beyond the other end. So the construction of the house is as such. Once this floor was up, you could stick your head down into the opening and you could see all the way to the back of the house or all the way to the front of the house. So it's like a balloon construction, but it's horizontal. Well, that let us take these, take these joists at a good healthy length and bring them in and feed them all the way across to the next carrier and then set them on the two carriers of the load bearing walls that were underneath it and, and, you know, and uh, screw them all together and redo the floor. To this day, the bathroom floor is the only floor in the house that does not squeak. <laughs> okay, so having gutted the bathroom, and now of course I was only here for a fairly short time because I flew in to gut the place, we then proceeded to the, to the primary bedroom on the front. Previous occupant had built this weird closet thing. So this wall came out, went 45 degrees, and then down here. And it consumed an awful lot of what was really a very small bedroom. And this was the view on the inside of that little closet. And it was, it was, it was a lot of space, but it was entirely unfunctional. So I decided it needed to go. Uh, here I am standing in the doorway to the closet. We're looking the other way. And, you know, obviously the construction is that you've got the roof line on the inside of each, each side. So we began to strip and take this closet out. And we did, and we drastically increased the size of the space by doing it. 
However, we still needed to have a closet because there, there are none in, in these old houses. So the plan was to come in and drop a wall this way, right where the roof line starts to come down and put in a couple of antique doors. So I would go up to Rochester Historic House Parts and I would buy antique parts and bring them back and put them into the house. I did that with a few projects. So we got that front room completely gutted and I called Bobby Hall and I said, Bobby, I'm leaving. I'm flying back to Arizona. Please come and do the floors while I'm gone. And he did. And he came right on schedule. He worked every day. He sent me photos at the end of every day with the progress that he had made on that particular day. One of the, one of the best people I've hired to work with me up here. So he was able, this actually is going into the kitchen. So this is the dining room. This is the kitchen. This is the old felt, that's uh, the old uh, felt paper that's glued down to the floor. He said, it took a lot of belts, Mr. Golden, but I got through it. <laughs> so this is the type of work he was, was successfully able to do. And he was able to get those floors right, totally restored, cleaned up, and he polyed them and did an absolutely gorgeous job. And when I saw these pictures, I knew that I had made the right decision in buying this house. He rebuilt the stairs, did a marvelous job. Those are oak and the hallways and, and all the way around through. This is one of the upstairs bedrooms. So these are fur, the, the floors of the fur, which they commonly put into the, on the second floor and they put the hardwood on the first floor. So this is the upstairs, two back bedrooms and the front primary bedroom. So we were absolutely thrilled to pieces with, with his work. So I wanted to research the house. I wanted to know its history. I wanted to know who built it and when. I wanted to hang a sign out front and I wanted it to say the old McManus place, right? Or the old Gillard place. I wanted the house to have a name and I wanted its name to mean something. So I began to research the house. You research a house the same way you research a genealogy. You find a name and you begin to go backwards. So I began to do that. However, it gets murky if you get back into the 1800s because the deeds literally say coming off of, this is the lot where the house is, so the deed would say coming off of Seward Street you go X number of feet. That's a really good start. But then the next one is it turns uh, 90 degrees west to Mechanis's barn. <laughs> and then it turns 63 degrees northeast to the oak tree. Okay? So it's really hard to research these old deeds. And I may have made a mistake down the way, but I worked really hard. I went up to, to the county seat up Geneseo and they were absolutely thrilled to work with me up there and show me how to research and find these old deeds. So we're looking at 1858 in Dansville, uh, the year that Lincoln said, a house divided by itself cannot stand. So Minnesota would have been admitted that year, right? So in 1858, we have this map of this piece of Dansville. Now this is what they called a fire map. So as the fire as the insurance companies began to determine whether or not they would insure your house, it depended on if you had water. And as the town expanded its water system from Main Street back, the insurance company agreed to insure more and more houses. So the insurance companies would draw out these maps. So we know that Dansville Village was full of nurseries, and these are all nursery lots, right? this is all nursery land. And then we have houses and we have names on a lot of the houses and the little house that we're talking about would set right there. So in 1872, 14 years later, the year that Yellowstone Park would be founded, we have a little bit of growth. We have more houses coming up. This is no longer nursery land. These are now lots that are empty. This is still nursery land and this one is and there's nursery land here and there around it, but they're starting to turn into actual house lots. So the furthest back that I went, I stopped in, in the 1800s. I didn't bother trying to get back before that. A lady named Marietta Tiffany sold the land that the house is currently on to this Mary Kid. 
I do not know who either one of these ladies are. They are not mentioned in Bunnell's histories of Dansville. However, Marietta Tiffany and Mary Kidd both owned a ton of properties. When I would get back to, to this point in time, you actually have to do a search for the name. You can't search for the lot in the old deeds. So I would go to the old books and I would search Mary Kidd and there would just be pages of properties that she owned. And there's no mention of, of either of these ladies in the, in, in the town history. I do not know who they were. I know who Marietta Tiffany's husband was. He's mentioned in the town history as the treasurer of one of the social clubs, but she is not mentioned. So in 1898, we come forward another 14 years, and here is the lot. Here's Sophia, here's Seward. Here is where the house would now be, and we have a couple of houses on this lot, which is interesting. We have a couple of houses on this lot. We have a couple of houses on this lot. Here we have discrete houses and lots. But as we zoom forward another six years, we now have the same single lot with several houses on it, including this big one, and this is where my house would be one day. And we have a large lot, large lot. We have large lots with multiple houses on them, which, which I was fascinated by. I thought that was very interesting. And here, in 1909, finally, our house appears. And if you look on the back, there's that little mudroom that I knew had to be original to the house based on its construction. So I was thrilled to see it. So since that is the, that's five years later, so the house is not on the 1904 maps, you know, 1904 time, but it does appear on 1909. So I know that that's when the house was built. And again, we have these multiple lots with houses on them. We have a large lot here with a house on it. So in here, uh, there wasn't any much change to Sophia Street, but these lots that were discrete earlier are now one large lot. And there's a house that was here right by the road that is missing, and this house is there, which is still owned by Mr. Derenbacher, my next door neighbor today. But it's interesting seeing the houses and, and how they are around, you know, how they are situated on the lots. So this was 1917. Uh, uh, suffragette New York gave women the right to vote. However, in Dansville, they voted against it. A piece of trivia for you there. So as part of the temperance movement, alcohol was banned in Dansville as well at this, at this same time. Uh, the Sugar Bowl restaurant, the first Sugar Bowl restaurant opened in 1917 here in town. And the United States declared war on Germany because its submarines were attacking our merchant ships and we entered World War I. So going forward another three years, uh, 1920, the Dansville Public Library finally received a building that they could move into the building that they're in right now, which was donated to them from the Shepherd family. Before that time, they were in the Maxwell block and they were in this block. They had been in three different locations until they found uh, their, own, their own home. Uh, and again, we, you know, we, just, we see the, the village. Now at this point in time, in 1926, Mary Kidd, the land baron, she passes away and the house is sold by her estate to Jacobina. Uh, Jacobina Zimmer owns the house and a few years later, she adds her daughter to it as a either or survivorship. This is the first year, the first time the house and the lot are matched in a deed. Up before that time, none of the house, none of the, the land did not match what it is right now. And there was just no reference to the house. So in uh, 1944, Nettie Zimmer sold the house uh, after Jacobina had passed away to Bert and Rita Stahl. Now I have a theory, and if there's any historians in the room who know what they're talking about, I don't, but I have a theory about Dansville. Now I said I wanted badly to name the house, to put a sign on it that this is the such and such a house, but I can't do that because the house was built on land that somebody owned, you know, several houses on it. So my theory is that the village of Dansville started when the nurseries pulled out because manufacturing was worth more. Women bought the land and built houses to rent. Now, that's just a theory. I don't know if it's true. 
And I'm hoping that there's somebody who knows more about the history of Dansville and can say I'm right or I'm wrong and why it is. But I can come up with no other reason why there's multiple houses on lots and the deeds only show the whole half a block. And then over the years, we see lots of houses being put in. Some of the old deeds that I saw said that so-and-so was selling the house to the next person, and beside it, it would say, for example, Bert and Rita Stahl, tenants, which tells me they may have been renters in the house, and the, the, the landlord or the estate from the landlord agreed to sell the house to the people that were renting it. But 1926 is the first survey done to actually cut the lot off that I currently live on. In 1949, Bert and Rita Stahl outgrew the house and they sold it to Paul and Mary Womp from here in town. And yes, he grew up in the house. Paul and Mary Womp sold it in 1949 to Gordon Rose. And Gordon Rose passed away in that house. In 1993, the estate of Gordon Rose sold it to a young girl named Amanda Teachout who bought the house by herself and it was her first house and she was a, a young girl. She then got married, changed her last name to Mellenbacher and added her husband to the deed and she began to raise her children in it until they outgrew the house and they sold it to Peter Drums and Holly Phelps who actually were brand new names to me as I researched this. I don't know if anybody knows them or not, but they're not names that have been known to me. Peter Drums hold it to a Timothy Climo and then this year, uh, 2021, I'm sorry, my wife and I became stewards of this property going forward. So now we've got to put the house back together again because I've got to come back. So we left the camper in Arizona. We hopped into the truck with Bushman in the back and we drove cross country back to New York to start to assemble this house. So starting in the upstairs front room, my wife says, I want my bedroom done first. I said, before the kitchen? She said, I want the bedroom done first. I took the hint. I did the bedroom first. So we framed in the closet. We found all kinds of interesting things. This piece of sheetrock actually ends three inches away from a stud. <laughs> if you do anything with building, that's just kind of not the thing you do. But we, we found a lot of that. You can see the tracks in the ceiling from that weird closet that I, that I removed. So we did frame in, we built it. Uh, that's actually more the color of, of this. It's a deep red. I don't know why it looks purplish in that color. But she painted, we built it, we framed in. We went up to Rochester, I bought these antique doors and then built frames to go around the doors. Now the woodwork was totally missing in this room. That's the inside of the little closet. So the woodwork was entirely missing. So I took a piece of woodwork that was existing and I made the router bits and made the tools so I could match match this profile, which you couldn't buy it anymore, and began to produce the wood needed to try to match the rest of the house. We put in a tin ceiling, and I always chuckle when I walk into this room, because when this house was built, now mind you, just above this tin is the original plaster. When this house was built, obviously the window people did not talk to the ceiling people, <laughs> or vice versa. It's not fixable. <laughs> there's, there's nothing you can do about that short of gutting it and raising the ceiling, which I no longer have the ambition to do. But you can see the closet over there is finished. So we did, we installed the ceilings and then she started the decorating and brought the whole place together. It was her color schemes, her paint and, and her everything that turned it into a, a very nice room. And yes, it's a very small room. Every room in the house is very small. So here's another view of it. You can see the closets in the background and that's the room as it exists today. So as we worked down from that room, we then moved in, whoop, two slides, that's okay. The first slide was just the shiny kitchen floor after it was done. We moved into the kitchen. Vivian said, I want open shelving. I said, marvelous, because I hate building cabinets. So in a very small kitchen, open shelving is very, very practical to not have cabinet doors. So I built a sink cabinet to, to go underneath the sink and, and some drawers on the sides for storage. And then we built open shelving to accommodate everything else. So this is the sink cabinet over here, obviously, for the sink in. And uh, there's the open shelving. As you can see, I did strip out the kitchen. And then we, this was a doorway in the earlier pictures. We filled this in, but 
if we filled it in totally, if you're in the kitchen and somebody walks in the front door, you don't know who walked in. So we left a window, a pass-through going out. And the kitchen is so small that when she entertains, if she's in the kitchen cooking, making a Thanksgiving dinner, and there's a bunch of people around, you know, they're migrating in and out of the kitchen. So in order to eliminate that from happening, this is the doorway, I cut open a pass-through through the wall. And so people in the dining room can have full uh, visibility directly into the kitchen and can chit-chat and, and talk while she doesn't have three people. Because as you can imagine, by the time you put in a stove here, you don't have a lot of space between those two rooms. Uh, even the dog, I trip over the dog. So uh, again, there was no woodwork. I created, I made the woodwork on both sides. This, all the way over here, is a pantry cabinet. So with a lack of storage space, Vivian came up with the idea. They said, well, why don't we see if we can find some antique doors and you could build a cabinet off of the wall and put the doors on the front of it so it would be an eight-foot high, just an open pantry. And so another trip up to historic house parts up in Rochester, and I was able to find an old wardrobe made of mahogany, and it was just the wardrobe front to so were able to get that and bring it home. Open shelving, because that's what she wanted. These are old antique brick molds that I put into this cabinet as drawers. So they're little drawers to hold the wine bottle opener and, and all the little cluttered things that end up getting down into the bottom of the silverware drawer and get lost. Now we're coming to countertops. So we needed to do countertops and we needed something that was different to put them together with. I hooked up with Patrick Van Dermy of the Van Dermys here in town. He's a very creative individual. If you've been to Battle Street Brewery, you see the results of his work in the walls and the tables. He built all of them. So I got with him and he had a supply or he had access to, these are tractor trailer floors. They're wood floors. They're hardwood that they line the bottoms of tractor trailers with, and he knew where he could get some. So he procured them, and using his brother Mike's workshop, uh, we planed them, finished them, and turned them into countertops. So here they are with the first layer of epoxy on them. Uh, there's the cutout for the sink. And then we brought them in, and we began to install them. So there's a backsplash, and there are these, these countertops and they've been epoxied and put in. And here you can see the, the, little, the little junk drawers all in a row up in there. So for the ceiling, we put the tin ceiling back in the ceiling and I needed the lighting to look right. So we chose the pedestal lighting with the on the wall wiring because that's the way they would have expanded the wiring in the error of the house. So it looks very error correct and that was important to me. And there it is in its finished form uh, that she works on it today. So this is a, a replica. It's not an original cast iron, you know, drain board sink. It's actually a replica of one. Uh, frankly, an original would have cost less. <laughs> but it's okay. So that's, that's it as it's done today. It's got little crown molding up in the corners. And here's the, the view looking the other way you can, with the sink and, and the, her stove. This is just a little cabinet. Uh, there's a little sandwich board in here that, that pulls out for for cutting sandwiches on. And here you can see the two, the two pass-throughs going into the dining room and going into the hallway. Now we have to finish the upstairs bathroom. And yes, her priorities were bedroom, kitchen, bathroom. So lastly, Chuck and I headed into the bathroom to try to get it done. Chuck can do tile. I refuse to do tile. So we did tile. And it came out nice. That's all, basically all Chuck's work. Uh, getting the tile was a real hassle because again, you know, it's post COVID. We had to try to get the exact same pattern from a half a dozen different sources because we can only get a few pieces here and a few pieces there, but we were able to piece it together and get it installed and put it in. So here's my efforts of pushing this back and relocating the tub from this wall to that wall, which you know, opens it up and, and makes it flow a lot nicer. Then Vivian came in after I did the, uh, the, wains, the uh, beadboard there, and she applied her technique with the paint. Uh, Chuck still yells at me because I tend to use ink pens to mark off distances, and Chuck says, don't do that because it bleeds through the paint. He's right, it does bleed through the paint. And, and it's there now, and I still continue to hear about it. 
Uh, we made use of some holes, some, some spaces that were in the back of the wall to put in some cubbies, and she picked out the sink. We salvaged this cabinet. There's only two things from the house originally that we salvaged. One was that mirror, because we really liked it, and the other is the lamp hanging over the stairs at the bottom of the stairs, because we really like that as well. Uh, and here it essentially is finished, and is what it looks like today. So, you know, very, I think it's a Victorian look in keeping with the, with the, uh, the spirit of the origin of the house. Uh, this is the dining room. It's finished, we with a tin ceiling. We bought a chandelier to try to match that one over the stairs as good as we reasonably, you know, as good as we reasonably could. Um, that's, a, that's my bar. That's a, you know, an old refrigerator that I've converted into a bar. Uh, the view out part of the living room. Uh, and uh, so there's that, there's the lamp that we salvaged and the stairs that were, uh, were all were redone. And that actually brings us to the end. And I'm just about on schedule. <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're too kind. So, you know, houses don't, you can get up, Jim. I don't mind. I, I, I'm winding down. Uh, my batteries are running low, so I'm winding down. Uh, you know, houses don't get an opportunity to go back. And it was very important to us that we take this house and as much as possible, we turn it back into what it was, as much as feasible. Because houses don't get a chance to do that. Flippers take them. So if a flipper had got this house and bought it instead of us, and there were plenty of them that were bidding on it, the carpeting would have come out, new carpeting would have gone in. Things like that bathroom floor probably would not have been fixed, the breaks in the bathroom floor. There's a number, there's a whole mess of things like that. I could spend three hours here showing you slides of absolute bird's nests of wiring, all with little wire nuts on them that we, we had to eliminate and, and work on. Uh, but, you know, like the garage, if it had fallen down and if, if, if somebody was not going to put any investment into the house, they would have just torn that garage down. And removing structures, houses being flipped, garages being torn down, does nothing to add value to the town. Houses are never worth as much when half of their structure is missing or hidden or curved on down the line. And it was very important to us to take at least this one house and perhaps hope it might inspire somebody else to come to town and buy one of the other old houses that are in, in much need and neglect in town and support code enforcement because they are absolutely the last line of defense before, between that and houses going to beyond the point. There are several houses here in town that we know are beyond the point of fixing up. And when that house gets torn down, it never generates any tax revenue. It never has any children to go down to Main Street and shop. It never has anybody to live in it to go down to, to Dugo's to get a drink and support that local business. So... It all starts with code enforcement, and, and it's, 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 I know it's a silly thing. You don't ever think about it, but they are the front line of defense with keeping houses in repairable and saleable and in good high-dollar condition. So that's my, that's my sales pitch. That's my soapbox, and that's my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, you have a question. Hang on. I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing, and I get a... Oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is the house painted. Uh, I didn't do photos of the house being painted because we hired, I couldn't get a local painter to paint for two years because they're booked out that far. So I hired an Amish fella and he was going to come in and paint it, but they don't like to have their photo taken. So we did take a few pictures, but I didn't include them in the presentation. So yeah, the house is three colors. It's red, it's green, and it's gold up on the, up on the top. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a dark picture and you... It's at 16 Sophia Street. You can drive by. <laughs> so, uh, and, and those are my wife's colors. That's, that's, that's her work. She's got good taste. Yep. Uh, Quinn, thank you very much. Um, for the Historical Society, if you want some brochures, there's a basket in the back for donations, etc. And Quinn has volunteered nicely to do anybody's house they want. <laughs> 
as your next project. Yeah, right? my next project. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.